Unit 5, Water and Wastewater. This is page 12, Module 3, Coagulation and Flocculation. The smallest particles settle the slowest, even for particles of the same density. That seems strange. A particle's mass decreases proportional to its volume. So mass is proportional to volume. And volume is proportional to diameter cubed, because the volume of a sphere is pi d cubed over 6. So if we compare a given particle with another particle whose diameter is 2 times smaller, then the volume of the second particle would be 2 cubed times smaller, or 8 times smaller than the first particle. And hence its mass proportionally would be 8 times smaller as well. Compare that with the surface area of a particle. And surface area affects its drag, the resistance to falling. So for surface area, it's proportional to the diameter squared. For a sphere, the area is equal to pi d squared over 4. So if we consider our original particle, and then our particle that has a diameter twice as small, its area, therefore, is 4 times smaller, not 8 times smaller like the volume. And if the area decreases by a factor of 4, then its drag force will decrease, but not as much as its mass has decreased. So a smaller particle will have a smaller mass-to-drag ratio, or a larger drag-to-mass ratio. Because as we shrink the size, the mass decreases much more quickly than the surface area. Or say it the other way, a smaller particle will have a larger drag to mass ratio. So coagulation and flocculation. Coagulation involves feeding and rapid mixing of one or more coagulants into the water to commence the formation of flock. And flocculation, which follows, requires gentle mixing of water and coagulants for a period of time to form heavier and heavier, more settleable flock particles. Non-settleable particles resist settling for two basic reasons. Extremely small particles are easily suspended by small currents, and negative surface charges on silts and clays keep particulate suspended. Recall that like charges repel each other. Particles can't coagulate or agglomerate. However, neutralization with a polyvalent cation such as aluminum plus 3 or iron plus 3 will eliminate or neutralize electrostatic repulsion, allowing fine particles to naturally aggregate due to van der Waal forces of attraction and settle. Most silts and clays are sodium and potassium aluminosilicates. Here's a typical formula here. Now the sodium and or potassium ions on the surface dissociate in water leaving the negatively charged ions which comprise the bulk of the mass of clay with a negatively charged surface. Now the two most common coagulants are aluminum sulfate or alum which is similar as we'll see and ferric chloride or ferric sulfate. Ferric chloride is an acidic water soluble salt. When it dissolves in water the pH drops. However, if the water is neutralized by the addition of a base such as lime, ferric ions precipitate as an orange gelatinous solid called iron 3 hydroxide. As this precipitate settles, it coagulates, pulls together, removes suspended solids. So here's the process of ferric chloride dissolving and then precipitating with some hydroxide ion from basic solution. It doesn't have to be very basic to do so. Even neutral solutions will contribute enough hydroxide to precipitate some ferric hydroxide. So ferric chloride and lime are stirred together in the turbid water. See the beaker on the right? This is clay suspended in water. We mix it with some ferric chloride. After several minutes, the stirring is stopped, and a gelatinous orange precipitate flock of ferric hydroxide settles and carries down suspended particles, leaving clarified water. That's the beaker here on the left. It's quite dramatic to watch, actually. If ferric ion is added in excess, 
It precipitates over time, producing rust-colored deposits on pipes and on porcelain fixtures. And so for this reason, even though it seems to outperform aluminum, aluminum is preferred. So aluminum sulfate is an alternative. It does not leave rusty deposits. Alum is another source of aluminum ion for water clarification. It's a naturally occurring mineral containing several similar compounds approximated by the formula potassium aluminum sulfate dodecahydrate. But basically it does the same thing. In water it releases aluminum plus three ions. So whether it's aluminum three or ferric ion, they work the same way. We get a polyvalent metal cation which precipitates with hydroxide forming a flock that carries down the particulate with it. And we have clarified water. Page 13 Zeta potential. If you do any work in water clarification, the term zeta potential will certainly crop up and you should know what it stands for, what it means. A little bit of review here. Water drawn from lakes and rivers contains suspended solids, often clay, that need to be removed before use. Both colloidal particles, that is those in the range of one nanometer to one micron, at suspensions, which range from 1 micron up to 10 microns, they're problematic. So visible light in the range 400 to 800 nanometers is scattered by particles larger than 400 nanometers, and that gives water a turbid appearance. And although clay is denser than water, the specific gravity is typically around 1.6, it may require days, weeks, or even years, many years, to settle naturally. And filtration is not practical for clarification of large volumes of water like would be used by a municipality because most colloidal particles are so small that the equipment required would be prohibitively costly. So suspended particles experience a natural attraction, all particles do, van der Waal forces to neighboring particles and they really should coagulate and settle. However, the particles, particularly clays, have negative surface charges as explained previously and the electrostatic charges repel each other, inhibiting coagulation. Now I have here a typical composition and potential structure of an aluminosilicate clay, a very common form of clay. So again, as explained, the potassium ions or sodium ions dissolve in water, leaving the clay surface with a negative charge. In addition, the small quantities of lesser charged magnesium or ferric ion that are maybe present in the clays may replace some of the aluminum ions, creating more negative charges on the surface. And the diagram opposite shows the ion clustering and electrical charges as a function of distance from the charged surface of a particle suspended in a dispersing medium. The magnitude of the electrostatic surface charge is referred to as the zeta potential. It's measured in millivolts. So here we have the gray sphere represents a clay particle. It's gray in this diagram and it has a surface charge that's as we mentioned is negative. Then we have a firm inner layer called the stern layer right around it and that would be cations that is counter ions to the clay and they're held pretty tightly at the surface then there's a second loose diffuse layer of cations and anions surrounds the stern layer and together these form what's called the double layer so zeta potential is the electrokinetic potential in millivolts notice how the charge at the surface of the sphere is highest and then decreases as we move further and further away from the sphere so the zeta potential, also called the electrokinetic potential, is measured in millivolts. It's the charge difference between the medium, in this case water, and the particle at the outer edge of the double layer here, and that's called the slipping plane. Now zeta potential is measured by a variety of different methods, and so a variety of different mathematical formulas are used. The zeta potential of a suspension is commonly measured in a cell that contains two inert electrodes. It could be gold or platinum. A DC voltage is applied to the electrode and the particles will migrate toward the electrode with the charge that is opposite to the surface charge. In the case of clays with a negative surface charge, the particles will migrate to the positively charged electrode, which is the anode.
This process is called electrophoresis, and electrophoresis was first described in 1807 by a Russian professor. It's the motion of dispersed particles relative to a fluid under the influence of a uniform electric field. So in this diagram above, on the right, a cation is electrostatically attracted to a negative electrode and dragging its double layer with it. Now if this was clay, we'd see the negative surface charge dragging a positive layer with it. The double layer resists the motion. It's a retardation force owing to friction. And this basically is a measure of the mobility of particles. The mobility is measured by light scattering from a laser. and The process is called electrophoretic light scattering, or sometimes called Doppler electrophoresis. And there's a frequency shift of an incident laser beam that depends upon the mobility of the migrating particles. We don't need to understand how the light scattering works. We're more interested in the magnitude of the zeta potential, what it means. So here's the formula for zeta potential calculated in this system. The zeta potential is proportional to the product of the mobility of the particle and the viscosity of fluid. And the zeta potential is inversely related to the particle radius here, A, and also to the thickness layer. And so particles with a larger particle radius A and a larger double thickness layer, those things getting larger would have decreased mobility. Now, zeta potential, it's easy to measure, but it has limitations. It's affected strongly by pH. It's also affected by a solution's ionic strength. If a solution has high ionic strength, the double layer shrinks. And if it shrinks, the zeta potential decreases as well. So we're not going to do any calculations with zeta potential, but I want you to appreciate the kind of values of zeta potential that will give optimized settling. Since surface charges inhibit particulate coagulation and settling, it stands to reason that neutralizing surface charges would promote coagulation. And thus, it's not surprising that suspended solids can be made to settle rapidly within minutes by treatment with a modest concentration of a coagulant. And we mentioned already that effective coagulants for suspended solids in water are highly charged inorganic ions like aluminum ion or ferric ion. So look at the chart here on the right. We have a suspension of clay in water. And this is the initial turbidity. It's about 610 NTUs, nephilometric turbidimetric units. Aluminum ion is being added. This is the coagulation dose in milligrams per liter. And as the alum is added, the turbidity of the suspension drops rapidly. At this point here, they're indicating a dose of 150 milligrams per liter of aluminum ion. This would represent the turbidity of the suspension, so it's greatly decreased. This graph also shows the zeta potential that's marked on the right-hand y-axis in millivolts versus the dose. Before any aluminum was added, the zeta potential was less than minus 20, so it's highly negatively charged. And then as the aluminum ion is added, the negative charge is being neutralized and the zeta potential is rising. At this point at 150 milligrams per liter, the zeta potential is around minus 7, I suppose. As we keep adding alum, notice that the turbidity reaches a minimum just below 100 at about 400 uh, milligrams per liter of aluminum, and the zeta potential has reached approximately zero at about 400 milligrams per of aluminum. I apologize, this is cut off by the diagram, so the words aren't all here. Settling is also aided by flocculation or precipitate growth. And aluminum, iron, and ferric iron will precipitate out as aluminum hydroxide and ferric hydroxide. These gelatinous solids drag the precipitate out of suspension as they settle. Since aluminum-3 and iron-3 and other polyvalent metal cations are acidic, a small quantity of lime, a base, may be added along with the alum or ferric chloride to ensure there's enough hydroxide ion available for the precipitation.
the chart on the right here shows the stability of a suspension versus zeta potential and pH. So when the zeta potential is large negative, like negative 30 or lower, or high positive, greater than 30 and above, the suspension is stable, meaning that it, the particles will not agglomerate, coagulate, and settle because they're suspended. But when the zeta potential is reduced in magnitude to less than plus 30 or greater than negative 30, the suspension is destabilized and the particles will agglomerate the best. Notice that the zeta potential is zero at a pH 5.5 in this diagram. This theoretically would have the best settling characteristics at this point. A negative zeta potential means that the surface charge of the particle is negative. Clay would have a negative zeta potential. Addition of a cation, such as aluminum, will make the zeta potential more positive and tend to destabilize the suspension, allowing agglomeration and settling. Many clays exhibit a zeta potential from negative 25 to negative 40 in neutral to basic media. Most bacteria have a negative surface charge, and so their removal is also attained by alum or ferric chloride addition. The chart also shows the effect of pH on zeta potential. Adding acid, moving this way, will increase zeta potential, whereby adding base would decrease it. So you have two factors to adjust. Not all particles have negative surface charges. Some industrial wastes have positive surface charges, in which case a polyvalent anion coagulant should be effective in aiding coagulation. For example, sodium phosphate is sometimes used. Its high negative charge will neutralize cationic surface charges and aid in coagulation and settling. Ionic polymers, surfactants, both cationic and anionic, are used as coagulants in addition to polyvalent inorganic ions. Many commercial products are sold as stabilized emulsions like paints and foods and cleaners, and in such cases it is desirable to maintain a high zeta potential and ensure the stability of the suspension, and hence the stability of the suspended product. Since zeta potential is predictive of colloidal stability, zeta potential is commonly measured and controlled. So now you have a background understanding of zeta potential.